email uh, inboxes. Uh, I am the special projects coordinator uh, for several years now with MACC. And I am joined today by Michelle Gerard, MACC's executive, uh, excuse me, uh, associate director and education coordinator. Um, and we are very excited to have Freddie Gillespie uh, give this wonderful presentation on native pollinators, native plant um, uh, initiatives that's going on in, in South Borough. And I'm gonna introduce um, Freddie now. And um, so Freddie has been an environmental problem solver and activist for 20 years at both the local and regional levels. Uh, her accomplishments range from successful land pr protection to river stewardship projects. She chairs Southboro's Open Space Preservation Commission and is a member of the Southboro Stewardship Committee. She also sits on an advisory committee of the Metro West Conservation Alliance, MCA. And uh, I also just want to make mention here because I, I think it's outstanding. Freddie has been a recipient of numerous awards for a dedication to conservation efforts in Southboro in the Metro West region. Uh, and this includes Massachusetts Con uh, Commission on Status of Women's Community Unsung Heroines Award, the Sudbury Valley Trustees Distinguished Public Service Award, River Stewardship Award from the National Park Service and the League of Women Voters, uh, Volunteer of the Year Award for the Suasco uh, Watershed uh, Community Council and Southboro Open Land Foundation Elaine Beals Award for Conservation. So, so lucky to have Freddie join us today and, and talk about such a, an important uh, subject. So, Freddie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, first, Michelle, were you going to do the poll first or before I start? You're muted. Certainly, I can do that right now. I'll launch the poll. Okay. And hope that people can respond. There are two questions here. Now, can people, are people finding it okay to respond? Oh, yeah, there you go. Wow, terrific. I'm going to end the polling for this question. Okay. And share the results. So we have quite a few who haven't seen Dr. Jagir's presentation yet. And um, some who are actively managing for pollination habitat on conservation land. That just gives me an idea. Um, there's an upcoming and I didn't put the link in, I'll send it to you later, Michelle, or maybe you can Google it. Okay. The um, New Hampshire Audubon, July 20th, is, Dr. Jagir is giving a free presentation. It's by Zoom, so you don't have to go to New Hampshire. And there are numerous presentations online you can find that Dr. Jagir has given, but his research is ongoing. And, you know, what was, what was true last year has been updated and changed for this year. So it's always best, I think, to try to get to one of his more recent ones. So I'll start the presentation. Um, my commission is the, um, charged with uh, facilitating the preservation of open space and, you know, as outright purchase of open space became more difficult in the South Borough area, very expensive and not a lot of it left. We looked at what are the values we're trying to enhance when we're preserving open space and we felt wildlife habitat and you can preserve open space by encouraging what people do in their own yards. But we also started looking at what happens on conservation land. So this is a conservation um, land story. I'm just going to see if there's a little box in the bottom of my screen. I'm going to see if I can move it. Give me one minute. It's oh, I there. Can't. If you hover, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's there, but it... it um... Yeah, there okay, you go. Got it. Okay. So we started a native pollinator, native plant initiative, thinking that was really an important thing to do because we're all dependent on our... You know, there's a crisis with insects and pollinators which relate to plants. So... Um, Breakneck Hill Conservation Land, we were the home of the belted Galway cows. They did a good job. Originally, they were there to um, keep 
this was an old apple orchard to keep the um, vines and you know plants and materials away from the apple trees. But the farmer got old and didn't move them around as much. And um, we had a, a story of uh, redemption restoration. Um, so in the beginning, there was oriental bittersweet. Lots of oriental bittersweet. Lots and lots of oriental bittersweet. This is a trail. These are all apple trees completely engulfed with oriental bittersweet um, and dead. So we got a grant. Um, well, before we got the grant, we had a, uh, in 2003, our commission hosted um, an invasive species walk. If anyone remembers back then, um, we used to have a thing called Biodiversity Day. And this was one of the events. I was the Biodiversity Day leader for my town. We would host different events. And this was one we had. Peter Alden was Mr. Biodiversity for the state. And um, Jeff Collins from Mass Audubon was there. And Peter declared it the worst bittersweet infestation in Metro West. We got a grant. Well, first we did planning and we got a grant from NRCS to remove the oriental bittersweet. A lot of it um, involved, you can't quite see it, but this whole area here, um, well, this, let me go back. This area in here was to be grasslands and these meadows areas, um, all of this was clear cut. This whole upper back part, it was 35 acres maybe. This is a hundred acre parcel altogether. And the cows had kept, been in the front pastures and had kept the bittersweet down, but the back. And then um, where we had the meadow areas, we did leave some trees, which you're seeing in this picture, but it was pretty devastating, the um, after fact. But I was told, you know, don't worry, it will come back. And um, we, we did the clear cut and this is what it looked like afterwards. Here's a comparison, the same trail, if you can see the man down here. And that right about there is where um, they were. So, and then we're managing for grassland birds. It was doing really well, but I was like, what do we plant? And I was told, don't worry about it. Mother nature will come in. And nowadays we know better. Just like we knew back in the day you had to, um, we took conservation land and we just set it aside and thought we put trails on it was enough. What we're learning is you constantly have to be managing it in this environment today with edge habitat and invasive species, right? So we have the grassland, we had no milkweed. So I spent quite a few years gathering milkweed seeds. We had kids and clubs dispersing it and we kind of let mother nature do its thing just by spreading it. We didn't plant plants and we got lots of milkweed, lots and lots of milkweed. And then we got monarchs. And we call monarchs the gateway drug to pollinators because once you're interested, you know, people get interested in that, it's easy to get them to be engaged with other pollinators. And this was er early on. Um, since then, we've heard more about the pollinator, you know, the complete collapse of our insect population and particularly with pollinators are in deep trouble, right? Um, so we also, we got interested in pollinators. We created a pollinator hill. We planted hundreds of wildflowers. There's typical list from Xerces societies. Um, but after planting hundreds of native plants, Canadian goldenrod, which is native, came in, took over and became a monoculture. So I had a period of time, was it Wildflower Hill or was it Freddie's Folly? Um, so then we had to do management of, of that. So this is a point I keep coming back to. And anyone of my age knows um, who this is from the first season of Saturday Night Live, but it's always something. And when you're doing land management, it helps to have a sense of humor. And for me, um, this saying comes back to me always over and over again. Um, I just lost my... It's always something, and I keep saying that. So we, we had Wildflower Hill, but then 
became engulfed with a native species creating a monoculture. So we had to manage for that. And we did. We changed our mowing schedule. We brought a winter sow in. It brought back diversity. We also planted three pollinator gardens, again, with the typical plants you find on all your pollinator list, right? That um, great, for, great for pollinators, a lot of um, wonderful list out there. We, this is the um, area of one of the pollinator gardens. And we had lots of flowers and butterflies and diversity of butterflies and then get the birds. We had a lot of different um, plants, hummingbirds, indigo buntings, bluebirds, swallows. We're doing great, lots of butterflies and birds. So thinking we're doing really great. And then I went to this conference out in Petersham. It was called Beyond the Honey Bee. We're worried about the wrong bee. Around this time in 2015, there was, everyone was talking about, you know, we have to save the bee, save the honeybees. Um, there was the colony collapse, which was, a, was a, like the canary in the coal mine, letting us know there was something really wrong going on. But all the attention was to the honey bee. And um, at, that, at that conference, Dr. Pro, uh, Professor Dr. Jagir, am I saying that? Um, Dr. G Gear presented on bumblebees. And at that time, I only knew there was one bumblebee. I mean, I wasn't, you know, like, what's a bumblebee? It's like that one bee. And then I came to learn there are 4,000 native bees in North America. I forget how many in Massachusetts. I think it's over 350, maybe close to 400. I should look that up. But anyhow, I invited them to Breakneck Hill, thinking we'd get a big pat on our back for what a great job we've been doing with all these pollinator gardens. And um, he came and he changed everything for us. Um, and I mean everything, how we manage the land. Uh, one of the first things he did find was um, Bombus fervidus. And that is now listed as a species of greatest conservation need in the state um, wildlife action plan. And that's significant. That's um, Bombus fervidus on clover at Breakneck Hill. And what we did is we, we started training of citizens. Um, Dr. Jagir adopted our conservation land as his first research site. They, he had a grad student who did weekly survey. This was in 2015 and they're continuing on today um, monitoring. We have two new projects, by, or different projects with grad students, but we're still monitoring the uh, bee population at Breakneck Hill. And um, the citizen science, was becology and what that is, is you go out and you identify, you take videos of bees on plants and you submit them. And that's where he gets his information. One of the places besides these grids, surveys and um, research sites, he gets his information on what plants the bumblebees are using. And now he's expanded it to butterflies and other bees as well. But we've started in on Bumblebees, so this talk is focused on bumblebees, which I know the most about, which is um, called Bombus, and Bombus fervidus being the rarest one. We had, um, he traditionally, we could have expected nine species of bumblebees at Breakneck Hill. When uh, Dr. G. Gear came, there were only six left, and we were closely headed towards four, the two most rare. Um, not rare, but at risk, Bombus fervidus and Bombus vagans were headed out. So anyone who's interested in this should try out, the, um, go to the Becology website. There's a link there, and I think Michelle will send it out um, later as well in the chat. So there's the Becology website. Um, it's at WPI. Dr. Jagir is now at um, U of Mass Dartmouth, but the Becology site still is housed at WPI. And here's his contact information at WPI that will be um, on this available to get later, maybe in the chat too. So what happened to Breakneck Hill Conservation Land today after we worked with Dr. Jagir? Um, well, the first thing is um, our first research found fervidus, but it was only on non-native plants. 
And what we found out is we just didn't have native plants it really needed or enough of them. And here it is on clover. We had zinnia that was in the community garden, clover, vetch is another plant it uses. We had a very small population. So after all this research in um, ecology, in you know, the citizen science, Dr. G. Gear created a plant list. And as I say, it's evolving and dynamic. It changes. A plant that's not on it today may be on it tomorrow. He's now including at-risk butterflies and um, other bees. And when we say at risk, what are we talking about? We're talking about bees for the bees and butterflies, pollinators, that um, their numbers of their population has declined over historical numbers. Not all species of bees are declining. Bombus and patients has increased it over historical numbers. And you will often find them on um, plants that non-native plants they've adapted to. So we find them on purple loose strife, and I'll talk more about that later. So here's how you use Rob's list. Um, and this is all on his website, so I don't need to go over it in detail. But in our area of Metro West, the plants we're um, looking at, the, the at-risk species we're looking at are the plants for Bombus fervidus and Bombus vagans. And you, the big point that Rob has pushed to everyone is you have to have both nectar and pollen the full season. So when they emerge in early spring, you need pollen and nectar there. No pollen, no next generation. Nectar is their energy source. I have been told um, 48 hours, no nectar, they die. I also recently heard it might be as much as 24 hours. So if they emerge from winter hibernation and there's no nectar, no next generation, but there's no, I mean, no, no, um, they die within a 48 hours and no pollen, they can't create a next generation. So you have to have both and you have to have both the whole season to create, to keep the bees alive and also the pollen so that they can create a healthy population um, to go into the next season. So um, this here is actually cut and pasted from Rob's uh, website, so I don't need to go over it all. But um, there's a method to it. And then this is a screenshot of his list. And you can't read all the plants, but I can give you an idea. What you have is um, all the pollen plants and then all the nectar plants. And if you look over here, I, I edited this um, spreadsheet because I took out the the bee we don't use. And we're looking at um, Bombus fervidus. And what we found out is that all of the plants that fervidus uses, Bombus vagans uses. So by focusing for us, that was our choice to focus on Bombus fervidus, we are also giving all the resources that Bombus vagans needs. So fervidus is in this first column, vagans is here. And then these are the months of the plants bloom time. So you want to be sure you have um, early, early um, spring plants and then all the way through the fall. But what we also noticed is that we're lacking some information still. We don't know what the earliest spring um, pollen plants are for fervidus. There's a lot of, um, sorry, back to this way. So this is continuing on with his list. So you go to his website, his plant list, and you will find, you know, all the plants for um, the, the at-risk bees, but you will also find ones for butterflies and other bees. So last year, we, we decided to do a um, we created a ecology research garden. And this is one of those things that we wanted, we were feeling in a crisis because in 2019, um, we had seen one sickly queen bumblebee in early spring and then no more. We had lost the population of Bombus fervidus. So, you know, this is sort of like we'd been focusing on it and looking for it for since 2015. And in 2019, it was, it just was gone. So we felt the urgency and 
there was this area of abandoned old um, community gardens. And usually you should take a few years to create soil prep, one year to two to get it, you know, weed free and to plant it. But we were determined. And because of COVID, I had a lot of volunteers, people looking to do things. So we took this and um, it's a whole nother presentation on how we did it. Rob brought us some plants to start with. And um, we also have a, not a Facebook group. And through that, we got all these volunteers. Um, it was incredible. I need to always thank them. And it's the native plant gardens of Southboro, but we allow people from other areas to come and join us as long as we're talking about native plants to Southboro and only native pollinators. And some of our best volunteers have come from outside of Southboro, but we're trying to really focus on building up these gardens throughout town. And there's the, here's the uh, garden. We got it down to dirt and we're starting to plant. These are the shrubs. Um, but it just goes to show my favorite saying, it's, if it's not one thing, it's another because right after we did that, um, I don't have the picture of it. I'm sorry to show, say, but um, the weeds it, came. And that, wasn't there also a drought? Well, it was a drought, but yes, it was a drought. It was a huge drought, but the worst thing, can you see this grass over here? Um, can you see my cursor over on this side here? That's not grass, that's weeds that's been mowed. And the same thing happened here. That dirt turned into calf high weeds as we're planting it. So we started out planting in the dirt and then it, the weeds came in. We had someone come in with a mower and we actually wall to walled carpeted, it's about Half, at least half of it we got some of the plants in before the weeds came and then mulched but um, we got wall-to-wall -wall carpeted with um, cardboard and we also had some uh, burlap so here we keep working but these are the this is um, like a month or two later those small plants I showed you here they are in the back and we continue to plant and um, it's quite an amazing effort all summer. This here, maybe this shows you better. This, this grassy area in the front here, that's all weeds that's been mowed. And that all this area here with these brown um, garden beds, that has all been cardboard and we brought topsoil on top and then we planted into it. So the reason I'm bringing this up is just like with Wildflower Hill and the, well, first there was no milkweed, then Wildflower Hill, the goldenrod took over. We planted the um, we planted the uh, pollinator gardens, but and I neglect. I'll get back to it, but I'm neglected to say we've never seen Bombus fervidus on our pollinator gardens, and there's a there's a point to be aware of there. So we decided we needed this ecology garden, and the weeds came. And instead of walking away and giving up, we just kept working. And pivot is my other thing. It's always something and pivot, you know, you, and just know when you're doing work, nature isn't static, it doesn't do what you want it to do. And you can have wonderful plans and talk to the experts and get good advice and still something will happen that you're not expecting. And you just need to come up with the next best thing and just keep moving forward. So we planted this and um, we just kept working and it, it's been an amazing, it doesn't look anything like this. I'm sorry, I don't have the pictures right now of today, but. This is the garden plan last summer. We have hundreds of plants in there, numerous species of Dr. from Dr. G. Gear's list. We have shrubs. Um, we cover pollen and nectar over and over again from early spring um, to the fall. And um, what happened? Well, when we started planting it, before we were even done planting it, in July, Bombus fervidus shows up on steeple bush. Now, I had been looking from 2015, constantly out looking. We had other volunteers looking. Dr. G. Gears out looking. His grad students are. And I'm in that garden weeding, and there's Bombus fervidus. Um, that's Bombus fervidus right there. And it was like, it made my heart sink, you know, because we worked really hard to get this. And then until this moment, Rob was only had a list. And it wasn't proven, would it work? You know, we felt planted, they will come. But 
here we are, they came. But even better than that, and they kept coming, um, even better than that, um, oh, it's switching gear. So um, honeybees on purple loosestrife, let me get back to the gardening after I go through this slides out of whack. But anyhow, non-native honeybees harm our ecosystems. Most people don't know this. They're really important for our factory farms, but there's no need to have them on your conservation land. No need to have them at a community garden. Our native bees can pollinate everything you need and some do it better. Bumblebees are the best pollinators of um, blueberries, for example. If you want to have pollinators for your community garden, set up a, a pollinator plant area using Dr. G. Gear's list and you'll be doing just fine. Um, we had had um, honeybees at Breakneck Hill because it had been an orchard Then the farmer left and then the eventually the bees left and um, the bees kept coming back though because we had purple loosestrife and it would look like the happy hour at the uh, whatever, the OK Corral or whatever, there'd be thousands of honeybees and bombus impatiens. And what happened is, um, as this wetland expanded, the purple loosestrife expanded and it took over three acres of wetlands and became another monoculture. And this was in 2019. Um, we had started working on it in 2017. We had cut some of the flower heads off and Rob had seen an increase in the diversity of the bees after we got rid of the purple loosestrife, um, just because there weren't as many honeybees there. And then what happened, well, I say just because I'm not a scientist, I want to say that I don't have the data, but we cut off the top, the flowering heads and we had better numbers. But then what happened is, um, you know, that wasn't a long term and they kept spreading because, you know, honeybees are really good pollinators of purple loosestrife and other invasive species. And this is just a, I, I, I focus on this because people don't know there's this big myth out there, say pollinators get honeybee hives. If you don't have a farm, you don't need honeybee hives, you're not helping. And that's, that really needs to get out there. And when I first learned about it, I would whisper because I was afraid of being tarred and feathered and run out of town because people love their honeybees. And there's this whole cult around it and it's misinformation. And if you don't have to believe me, Google it. Sierra Club did a great story. And since um, I went to Rob's um, workshop in 2015, Beyond the Honeybee, um, numerous scientific papers peer reviewed have come out. The problem is that the popular media doesn't cover it. And even when they do, what do they do? They put a picture of a honeybee on the cover story because people don't even know. Um, it's constant, constant honeybee this, honeybee that. And, you know, if you're not running a farm, you don't need honeybees. And I hope I don't make anyone here who's a beekeeper mad, but this, this information needs to get out there. So can I, when we, can I interrupt for a minute? Yeah. Is the point really that the honeybee is, is, um, is uh, what, do I, uh, what do you call it? In, in uh, you know, fighting for the same, for the same uh, uh, pollen and uh, competing for the same pollen and, and as the native bees and the native pollinators? Well, it does a few things. And there still needs to be more research. But what we have seen, I've seen videos where, um, for those who don't know, bumblebees have a basket on their hind legs, the workers, to collect pollen that they bring back to the hive, to the nest, right? So when they're out on a flower, there's videos of honeybees coming up, the bumblebees working hard, collecting pollen, collecting pollen, and the honeybee comes up behind them and steals the pollen out of their basket. That's a video out there. They're also kept in large hives. They have disease and parasites that they go out and then they spread to our, you know, they're flying around and they spread it to our regular flowers that um, other bees come and visit and pick up. And yes, the out competition is huge. So you can see, we went to Joe Pie Weed once and it had 200 honeybees to two all other kind of bees. They are more aggressive. I've seen them push other bees off flowers. And a hive will have 
10 to 30,000 bees, I believe. I'm not, a, I'm not a beekeeper, so I don't have the exact numbers. People will have up to five hives. This is like releasing every day 150,000 bees into the neighborhood. Now think of it, they're classified as livestock. Can you keep, can you keep a thousand goats in your yard and every day open up the gates and let them go to your neighbor's yard and eat everything in their yard? That's what happened. I couldn't plant plants fast enough at Breakneck Hill that weren't covered with honeybees. So um, when the honeybee population declined, we saw more diversity. You know, I don't, that's not a study I don't think we're doing at Breakneck Hill, but it's an anecdotal, you know, just by looking. And also they're really good at pollinating invasive species. Non-native bees pollinate non-native plants really well. I've never seen Bombus fervidus on um, purple loosestrife. I've never seen it on um, what's that Japanese knotweed. You know, take take your take your pick. It's not a plant they use. So more research, but people need to start thinking about it. Let's be working for our native bees if we're doing conservation work. If you're a farmer, it's another story. You know, but. So here we have, after we got rid of the purple loose strife, we did a massive restoration project in the wetlands. And it was a little bit freaky because, you know, we were working in wetlands. And then what happened is while I was seeing the bombus fervidus on the steeple bush, Rob was surveying a swamp milkweed shrub, a swamp uh, rose. And he, he texted me, he says, oh my goodness, behind the rose was the biggest patch of monkey flower. Um, Mimulus Riggins, um, he had seen all season and it had been gone the year before because of the purple loose strife. So now we have this big patch naturally, you know, it was the seed source was there when we got rid of the purple loose strife, it came. You can't see the picture, but that's Bombus fervidus there. And also getting rid of the purple loose strife reduced the um, honeybee population. And back to your question about um, does it, um, impact if they're not using the same plants. I need to clarify that. For nectar, they're not. I mean, at this time of year, they're not, I'm not sure. Later in the season, after the purple loose strife left, there was competition on things like um, Joe Pye wheat. So they would use the same plant. But what happens is when the purple loose strife was there, it fed so many honeybees that their population could explode. And there was no um, monkey flower there for the honeybee, which, had disappeared from our conservation land in 2019. And here it is in 2020, I'm seeing it on the steeple bush and here it is on the monkey flower, both on Rob's list, Dr. Jagir's list. So, oh, this is a video Rob took, but it's sideways, but I don't know if you can see that's the, I thought I had taken it out, but anyhow, it's not a great sideways video, but it was, it had lots of Bombus fervidus on it, which was just exciting. And uh, here's another thing we did. So you plant the plants, but what do you, what else can you do if you have conservation land, right? And one of the things we're also doing is beyond these gardens, we're surveying the whole property to find, you know, one of the things really important is pussy willow. So we're like, oh, we have to plant pussy willow in the spring, early spring plant. And what happens is that we were mowing because we were so afraid of the, perp of the not the purple loose drive, sorry. Uh, we we're so afraid of the oriental bittersweet. We were mowing the whole landscape every year. And we knew we should be doing patchwork. But, you know, if you don't mow, you let invasives it's a it's a technique to manage invasives but we did s start switching over so we leave some areas unmown every year and then we did an inventory and we found oh we have um pussy willow so we flag that and when that section is its turn to get mowed it the pussy willow doesn't get mowed we've been doing it for other plants on rob's list we have row i mean we didn't know because we were mowing it all every year but now we have the native roses we have um, the native bush honeysuckle, steeple bush, um, meadowsweet, many plants that are on his list were 
on the landscape. But the reality is not as many as you think. And most people think conservation land has all these great native plants. Most of it's like our breakneck hill, old ag land, or you know, if you have open meadows. And it really doesn't have the diversity of plants and or um, native plants that you wish, right? So we're looking at, we're trying to encourage the plants we have there and thinking about how to establish more of the plants on Rob's list. But we did have these other um, pollinator gardens. And when I say we never saw Bombus fervidus on, it's because we planted with the typical plants and not the plants that um, the at-risk species need. And when I say typical plants, the plants you will find in these pollinator list, right? So what happens, you are planting for the common pollinators. And another thing is a lot of these lists were based on honeybees needs. What, what, what plants honeybees will use? I mean, the honeybee culture is, is pervasive. So we, we did an inventory of which plants there we had, and we started adding some of Rob's. So you can go to your conservation land and do the same thing. You take Rob's plant list and you go through it and you check out which plants you have that are on his list. And then you see which months you're covering. So if you can see this list for Bombus fervidus, we have pollen only for June and July. So, you know, they're, they're out of luck the rest of the months. But even worse is um, we don't have any um, nectar for them in April. So, I guess this is what you can do. Take his list, check off what plants you have on your conservation land. And, you know, you don't have to do it just for Bombus fervidus, do it for vegans and see other butterflies, you, you know, also. But see what you have and then see what you need to add in. So we're going to be looking for early spring blooming plants in those gardens or in those garden areas. Because that's another myth. Um, bumblebees don't fly that far. You know, so it's not like they're, they can fly up to, I don't know, maybe I've heard two miles, but really we're talking about 1900 feet from the nest. Anytime they have to fly far for resources, they're using up a lot of their energy to get it to it. So this is us going into our, the garden, the fervidus questing, what plants we had, we're weeding and we're planting more plants. But you can see, you know, like the favorite, um, some of these favorite plants, right? The black-eyed Susan and the, the daisy-shaped plants. Our at-risk species tend to need long-tubed plants, um, not the flat daisy-like plants. Um, mountain mint, you know, is always, you know, great, great, great pollinator plant. I can't rip it out fast enough and try to put in some of Rob's plants. I'm not saying there's not benefit, but if you plant Rob's plants, and I'm saying Rob, but I mean Dr. Jagir, if you plant his plants on his list, you will get the other species as well. You know, it's not like you're only going to be planting for Bombus fervidus and nobody else will come. Like uh, you saw there's um, milkweed on his list. You know, you get monarchs, you get caterpillars, you get swallowtails. I mean, we have all of that in the Becology Garden, but we're trying to get all these other plants in this area as well. And these are the first pollinator gardens we planted on Wildflower Hill. So there's two methods to utilize Dr. Jagir's list is you do a careful analysis and thoughtful planning. You take inventory of your existing plants and then fill in what you don't have. Massing matters, it's important, you know, if you have one plant, well, it's probably better than no plants, but, you know, using more to create, um, he prefers one meter by one meter, that's a little bit over three feet by three feet square. But, you know, in our yards and gardens, you know, you're in your own yard, you're not going to have that. You can do that on conservation land. And here's our statistics in 2019, zero. 10 to 15 in 2020, and 20 so far um, a week ago. We had 20 so far in 2021, and with maybe two nest sites instead of just one. Um, doesn't sound like a lot, but when this species is headed towards extinction, it's a big deal. And we're getting sightings all around, and we're um, also um, 
the other thing to do is to just plant something, plant anything. That slide was out of whack, sorry guys. Um, so be real careful, thoughtful analysis, but just do something if you can't, you know, you don't have to go out and do a big ecology research garden like we did, right? And we're trying to encourage people and I didn't have this in my talk, um, because people heard about what we're doing in Southboro, the Metro West Conservation Alliance, which is for 36 towns, it's basically the Suasco watershed, um, started a native pollinator task force. And we've been working really hard to replicate getting these plants out there throughout all 36 towns. And what we're doing right now, Lincoln came on board in a big way. Um, if you go to our website that uh, I gave Michelle a link to, we have lots of information on how to use Dr. G. Gear's list and um, many other um, great pieces of info. Where to get the oh, where to get the plants? That's the other limiting factor. Is these plants are not easily or readily available, and we're working to make that happen more often in nurseries. But more small local nurseries are growing them. We had a winter sow project last year. We gave out 700 seed packets to over 100 people, and they were all just from Rob's list. We're working on um, pollination preservation, public display gardens. Um, have one going in in Southboro at the public library we're starting. Other towns are coming on board. We recently had a garden tour. We had four locations, one in Weston on a rail trail, Lincoln at a private school, Chelmsford at their community gardens, and Southboro as well. So there's... Um, Lots of information out there we're trying to, well, not out there. We have lots of information we're trying to get out there. We're looking for ambassadors in each of the 36 communities in our region. But you don't have, again, just like our Southboro native plant gardens, you don't have to be from Metro West to take advantage of our resources. So I think that's it. And then it's time for questions and, I think uh, I do have that extra poll if you'd like me to uh, bring that up and yes. I, did, I did just put in the links to the Metro West Conservation Alliance the task force and the uh, uh, the face group your your Facebook group I just mentioned it I guess the links aren't there S3T is there though um, yeah so we're the MCA is hosted by SVT and we're part of the MCA the native pollinator task force so um, it gets a little confusing, but that's the SVT website. And then our Facebook group, I don't have a link for it. You just Google it. I mean, not Google it. If you're on Facebook, just search for Native Plant Gardens of Southboro. And then Dr. G. Gear's list and his Becology, um, Becology site. Mm -hmm. Here's that second poll. Um, if, if any of you have actually attended one of Dr. G. Gear's programs, are you involved in implementing his strategies or using his plant list? Um, and and I, I, I think that Norwell is uh, uh, possibly in the not yet, but almost, but, but waiting to do so. And uh, then the second question is if, if you answered yes to uh, this, uh, if you're willing to please identify the municipality where you're doing this work and you can uh, put that into the chat box because we don't have a way of typing in answers into the poll. So if you're doing this work in a particular town or city, or where is that city or town? We'd love to know. And please put those answers in the chat box. Okay, so we have three people have responded to your first question and they all happen to be not yet. I wanted to say why this is different than creating pollinator habitat on your conservation land question because what we found out is we had pollinator gardens and we were doing nothing for the at-risk species. And we also, when we took inventory, we had periods of time when we had nothing in bloom. And the big concept to take away is to always be thinking about, um, do you have something in bloom the whole season long, but do you have both nectar and pollen? And Bees have different length tongues, who knew? I thought there was one bumblebee, but um, they have long tongue and short tongues and medium tongues, but it, it's the long tongue bees who are declining and it tend to be most at risk. And one of the things on Rob's list 
is um, his plant list started showing that a lot of the plants that the at-risk bumblebees use are also state listed as at risk, endangered, or, uh, you know, on the watch list, I forget the terminology. There's three classifications. So not having the science to prove it, to me, it's intuitive that if you're losing the pollinators, you're losing the plants, or if you're losing the plants, you're losing the pollinators. They go kind of hand in hand. And what I didn't really specify in this talk is, um, the Native Pollinator Task Force of the Metro West Conservation Alliance, we're probably going to be changing our name soon because we've really adopted um, Rob's uh, premise that it's not about the pollinator. It's the relation between the pollinator and the plant. Mm -hmm. And not every time you see a bee on a flower, is that bee pollinating that flower? It could be a bee visitor. So we're talking about preserving the ecological function of the relationship between, you know, the animal and the plant. So our garden tour was called, um, and our gardens are actually called pollination preservation. We're, we want to preserve the whole system of pollination, not the pollinator, the animal itself, not the plant, the plant itself, but it's the relationship. So. It's pretty fascinating, and it's, it's also interesting to learn how the how the science is, uh, you know, what we know, what we don't know, and how much more research is needed. And I had asked a question, I typed it in, and you have answered it. It's like, just do something. Because if, if one tries to make the perfect garden, it, it could become an overwhelming project. And so I think if, I, I'm glad you brought that up, that if you could plant at least one plant and try to mass it, you've done something and you'll help a bee get from one, you, you, perhaps you were helping to connect, you know, make the connections like making our own pollinator greenway. All right, there's a lot of talk about pollinator pathways and why we haven't quite adopted that is, you know, because you need to be looking at the full picture. And yes, we want these habitats to connect, but it's not about just planting the, and I keep calling it the typical plant list. And you go out there and you Google and you'll come up with a plant list and they might have one or two of Rob's plants on it. But if you look at it, go to Rob's talk in New Hampshire. He, he does a really good analysis. They'll have one plant, you know, in one season that helps one of these um, bumblebees, but no pollen at the same time. I mean, you have to have, you know, it's like we need our vegetables and our, um, our grains and, you know, healthy, healthy fruits and fiber and all that. We don't live on just um, one, one component of eating, neither do the bees and butterflies also the new thing to be thinking about. We all talk about host plants. One of the projects he's got going on at Breakneck Hill, his, his grad student, I'm sure she's working elsewhere is, you know, what are the nectar plants? Because if anyone notices monarchs come and lay their eggs on milkweed, milkweed's not in bloom. Right? right? So you gotta be thinking about what do they use for nectar that you have that as well. And Monarchs aren't an at-risk species of butterfly. They're not state listed. That's a whole nother story, but it's an example. I don't want to confuse you by saying it is, but um, maybe because the pop, you know, the migration's in danger. I don't know if the population is, but um, it's just interesting for all butterflies. They have a host plant, but you know, if that plant's not blooming when they emerge, what good is it um, to not have to have the host plant and not have other food for the nectar they need? So, very good point. Do we have any questions? Uh, do people have any uh, additional questions uh, for Freddie and uh, her evidence of uh, what happens when you plant the plants that the uh, native pollinators need? Feel, feel free to unmute yourself. We're a small enough group that would work out fine. I think I put out a lot of information, but it's hard because we've been, there's so much and I, I just would love to share it all and, you know, trying to make it finite on one topic is hard because it all evolves, you know, it's like pulling a thread. So I would hope someone would have a question. So I don't, uh, I, can, can I make a comment? Um, 
So I used to be a beekeeper and I'm not anymore. And I thought I was planting um, good pollinator plants in my yard. And then after the talk I attended last night, I went out and observed my mountain mint, which was covered with honeybees and my um, flowering raspberry. And I watched, sadly, honeybees bully all the native pollinators off wow. the flowers. It was so disheartening. So it was just like, I guess I was not observing, observing what was happening closely enough. So I think like now I have a different view when I go outside and I observe what's going on in my own yard. I think everybody needs to like get the word out about this. And I also think citizen science projects are great and it's a great way to get the, the community involved in also being part of this science project. Yeah. Um the Becology Research Project's great because it gets you to identifying bees because one of the first things we did is um, we'd see a plant with lots of bees on it, right? And I'd, I'd be all excited and I'd, I'd share it with Dr. Jaguar and I'd be like, oh, all these bees, great plant. And this would be on a Facebook group. I set up a small group for us that were doing the, uh, the inventorying and before, oh, before there was Becology, right? Um, we were actually one of the beta testers of that app before it became a citizen science project. So we'd send him our, our pictures or our videos. And he, he responded with two words, Bombus impatience. <laughs> and I could hear the phone click. I mean, it was on Facebook, but I could hear the phone click, right? <laughs> it's like um, constantly, oh, look, all the bees. And I hear it all the time. Oh, this is a great pollinator plant. Look at all the bees. And the question is, what species? Mm -hmm. And diversity matters. So if you have a thousand honeybees on your plant, it doesn't make it a good pollinator plant. It makes it a good plant for non-native honeybees. And or if you have, um, no, you know, Bombus impatience isn't at risk now, and it's actually increasing. It's filling the niche, maybe, that these other bees disappearing. Um, for whatever reason, it can hold its own. But um, once you start really paying attention, the same thing, I will say, if you have conservation land, I'm thinking most people here are on conservation commissions, don't think because you have conservation land that it's got great plants. And I read a research paper once that said something like a hundred years after farming stops, you're not likely to have even 75% of the habitat that was there before. Farming doesn't toll on our, the soil and the composition and ag weeds. And, you know, with invasive species, not even invasive species, ag weeds are pretty aggressive and um, they will outcompete our native plants. We see it all the time. Like, um, St. John's wort is a big plant on Dr. G. Gear's list. Our conservation land is covered in St. John's wort. None of it native. Why is the non-native non so, you know, able to take over the, the land? I don't know, but we want to get the native species back. And a lot of this is because when you did the clearing and then, you, you know, um, certainly with livestock, hay comes in with different types of um, ag weeds in it. So um, it's a constant struggle to try to get native plants on, especially in meadows, which are, you know, not going back to forest. Um, you have to artificially manage them one way or another. But a couple of other things we've done um, and to be aware of is mosquito spraying. You know, that's another big myth. It doesn't kill just mosquitoes. And it actually doesn't do, um, MACC had a great workshop um, at your conference on um, the effect of mosquito spraying and two things. It doesn't do a great job at controlling the mosquito population. Um, the aerial spraying they did recently, at least that one. Doing the larvicide one is much better and it hits, that does target mosquitoes. But this spraying is just, you know, why, it, it's not solving the problem. And I also heard, that maybe it has helped spread the disease to other areas. You know how it used to be in the southeast of Massachusetts and now it's going across the state? Well, the birds had no insects to eat, so infected birds might go out to the western part of the state and then they're spreading the um, spreading the uh, triple E. That was just one theory. I don't know if there's the science, but um, Mass Audubon did a survey. So what we have done in, in Southboro, we're part of a uh, state state plan 
I mean, a state um, mosquito control group, and they come by and they spray everywhere. And you can register your land not to get sprayed, but they still might spray it. So you all actually have to register it and you have to post no spray signs. And we've done that for our conservation land. Because why should we be spraying conservation land for mosquitoes? Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's killing bees and butterflies and all other insects and destroying the food web for the, um, for the birds to have. And people don't, re Doug Callamy is another great um, lecturer to listen to. What is it, six to 7,000 caterpillars to rear a clutch of chickadees? And if you're killing all the caterpillars with mosquito spray, you know, you're wiping out um, next generations of birds as well. Yeah, the, um, there are a couple of, question, a couple of questions, um, uh, three actually. Laura is asking, how can we get state agencies like DCR to take this on? And then there are questions about uh, sources for uh, native plants. And a few have been mentioned, like blue stem natives in Norwell. So wherever you go, unless you know the, the source, you have to be very careful to not purchase cultivars. Native Plant Trust, Garden in the Woods, Nisami Farms, they, they sell cultivars. So oh, okay. be, be aware, you know, whatever their reasoning is, I'm not going to assume to guess, but be aware. Blue Stem Nursery is great and they work with Dr. Jagir and they supply a lot of his plants. There's also another small one out in Spencer, Mass. Um, Ellen Sousa. Oh, yeah. I think it's, I always say it backwards, Turkey Brook Hill Farm or Turkey Hill Brook Farm, but it's Turkey Brook and Hill are in the name. Farm is the last. Um, she does great work. Um, if you go to the native pollinator task force website we have a list where we went through in a static it's a point in time but we went through dr g gear's list and all the nurseries that we could find that sell his plants and then we listed which plants that nurse it's done three ways all the plants all the nurseries you can go to the plant and find out what nurseries sell that plant and you can go to the nursery and find out which of rob's plants they sell bigelow nursery does a great job too in northboro they're um they don't sell just straight species, but you know we have to educate ourselves. And why is it important not to get cultivars? We've had two examples of thinking we had a straight species and it had been a cultivar and it had no nectar. Mm. We, we cultivate plants for what people want, not what the insects and what their role in um, the ecosystem is. Was there another question? Oh, DCR. Yeah, I was really disappointed. They just rolled out this big plan and um, it's a start, but it, it really, I don't know if anyone saw it. It was a pollinator uh, kit that they distributed and it had some seeds. I think the seed list wasn't that great. They did give out a native geranium, which was good. I think it's a step in the right direction, but I wish they would be more in line with um, Dr. G. Gear's work because, you know, it's not that doing other pollinator work is, isn't better than doing nothing, but I, I liken it to if you have, you know, a starving population in another country, and instead of you have the opportunity to feed them balanced diet, but instead of doing that, you give them some milk and I mean, you give them some water and stale bread. Um, I liken the, the plant list that we're helping some pollinators that don't really need our help. We're helping them increase their populations to the detriment of the others. And that has an impact. So um, one of the plants on Rob's list is the native lupine, which we know that well, most people should know. The lupine you get almost always in you know, native plant um, nurseries is non-native to this area and it's actually be almost invasive. All the stuff you see growing in Maine and Vermont that's along the roadside is non-native, right? So the native lupine um, is the host plant to the endangered carner blue butterfly. If you lose the pollinator for that plant and you lose the plant, you also lose the native, you know, the carner blue butterfly. And what else? I mean, 
nature so amazing the web goes on and on and we don't even have the beginning of knowledge of what we're losing when we lose a species and that's why it's so important to help the non um sorry to help the at-risk species and not the common pollinators and by helping the the at-risk ones i'm telling you we have all the you know it's not like they avoid all the other pollinators in our other pollinator gardens they don't stay out of the becology research garden they're there too right they're there but we also have all of the at risk that we have in our area bombus vagans has a great population at breakneck hill now that's great i'm just not that good at identifying it and so it's easier to focus also uh, fervidus is listed of its highest conservation need on the state wildlife action plan great well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Freddie, for sharing your uh, your results and your work trying to uh, uh, implement in a, in a very real way, a very large way, um, planting the native pollinators off of uh, implementing Dr. Jaguer's uh, research and using his plant list to make a difference in your area and spreading the word to other communities as well. It's, it's been remarkable. I, and I, I know we're ending, I don't even know if we've gone over time, but check out the, the plant list yes. on the Native Pollinator Task Force. And it's, it's, it's a little bit of a clunky website, I'll, I'll say to that. So, you know, there's links there to other pages when you go to the home page. And um, I'm not even sure, it's not, I always have trouble like, where is it, where is it? But, you know, click on the links and you'll find, um, you'll find it eventually. And it really is a wonderful resource to, to get the plants on Dr. G Gear's list. And like I said, we're working really hard to make them more available. Just like not native plants aren't that available in nurseries all around, trying to find Rob's plants is even more difficult. And it's so critically important that, you know, it's, we need to keep asking. And as we ask, people start, you know, carrying them. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank, well, thank you very much. And thank you for attending today. Uh, we have recorded this. We will have it available. And Joey, do, do you, um, I think we post this on our electronic uh, resource library. Yeah, I can uh, get the, if I can get these slides from you, Freddie, and, and I can post it into our electronic resource library, yes. Yeah, okay. And, and anyone that is looking for the recording can email us and yes. and uh, uh, get the recording. Yeah, exactly. And I ask, um, did you share that Dr. G. Gear has a webinar July 20th, New Hampshire Audubon? You can Google yes. that yes. and find it. Is yeah. it it's here. OK, yeah, thank you. Here. And I also, I'm going to re, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, where is that? Joey put that up. Here it is. Free, the free program this this weekend. I will put that at the bottom again. Oops, it didn't. Uh, Joey, can you do that? It's not letting me cut and paste. Second. Oh, I've I figured out a way. So, thanks for your patience, everybody. Here's um here's the New Hampshire. And then I did put in the link to his uh, Dr. Jaguer's list. Let me find that. And while Michelle is doing that, um, also I just want to call everyone's attention to um, our, our publications um, selection. We do have the wonderful pollinator book that's put out by the Associates Society. Um, and uh, also we have, we do have a small, you know, we're talking about citizen science. Um, we do have a small book on um, how to be a citizen scientist in your community and, and how to develop that uh, culture within your community. So if you go to MECC's online store, you can see those two publications. Um, the uh, pollinator book, because it is a popular time of the year, it does say that it's out of stock. But if you do order it, it's it will be in stock soon. And uh, Michelle's holding up a, another publication, um, pollinators of native plants. This is something we may actually bring into our selection. So yeah, it's by Heather Holm, and it talks about the uh, relationship between the pollinator and the plant. And I think that you know that just hits home 
that hits the nail on the head with what Freddie's been discussing today. So pollinators of native plants by Heather Holm. Well, thank you again, everyone. And thank you, Freddie, for taking the time to share this uh, work that you're doing and its results uh, with all of us. Sort of the real, the real work in the ground. You know? Shovel in the ground. Yeah. And don't forget, there's always something. <laughs> But yep. pivot, and you can find a way to make things happen. And right. even one plant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great Bye. afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Freddie.